Okay, great. This is, this is a tremendous crowd. I really want to thank everyone for, uh, for participating as we kick off Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And as uh, Major Stansbury said, and as the chaplain said, uh, it's important to seize the opportunity here uh, to use an event like this to, to kick off awareness, but really where we're trying to go here is where all of us, from private to general, embrace this initiative to have a culture of dignity and respect in our formations. Not only here in Arlington Hall Station, uh, over in the swing space at the Pentagon, but in the 54 states, territories, and the district in partnership with the Adjutants General. Uh, this is about embracing that culture and taking charge of it and making it our own and, and being leaders, no matter what your rank is, and being open to meet uh, folks in a time of need. And so as we think about living our Army values, that really is what allows us to make change. So as we apply resources to eliminating a crime of sexual assault in our formations and recognizing that it's counter to our profession, the profession of arms, the profession of being a military member, that helps and guides us in that, in, that, uh, in that effort. And so events like today bring awareness, but it's really a 365 degree, 24 seven effort. And it happens in how we train. We have full-time sexual assault response coordinators and victim advocates in the states, territories, and the district. We trained collateral duty almost 2,500 collateral duty victim advocates, again, out in the states, territories, and the district. And we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to apply resources to do that. But really, this is about living our Army values. And when an incident of sexual assault does occur, that we protect the victim, we safeguard the victim, uh, when circumstances allow us that we investigate and we hold people accountable. And that's really living our Army values to, to, to be able to do that. And as we think about how we train, we need to get away from PowerPoint and we need to get down into small unit interactions with the men and women that serve with us. That's the most effective tool we have, where it's leader-led, at the small unit level. And so as we incorporate uh, integrity and our warrior ethos into that training, we'll see benefit from that. I, I firmly believe that. We're responsible as leaders to set the standard and create that culture of dignity and respect. And it doesn't matter what your rank is. That's just part of leadership. And that's part of who we are as guardsmen and women and being proud of where we serve and making a safe environment for our members to serve in. And, and we own that. So I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Colonel Branch Hoflin, Major Stansbury, our whole team, uh, all of you for being here today and helping us bring awareness to the issue, but really carrying this forward throughout the year, every day, in how we approach our workplace, how we approach others that work with us, how we care for each other, and how we create that environment where people can serve to the best of their ability and they do so safely. And we bring, uh, we bring resources to bear when they're needed. So I wanna thank you for being here today and I really look forward to uh, the proclamation and kicking off Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Thank you. Thank you, General Lyons. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Sergeant Major uh, Motley. Sergeant Major is the uh, Joint Force Headquarters SARC for the state of Virginia. Uh, he has been serving as the SARC for six years now. Um, 
and has responded in numerous cases of sexual assault, but more importantly has uh, responded in taking care of those survivors and victims of sexual assault. So, uh, Sergeant Major. Good morning, General Lyons, General Colonel Thorpe, Sergeant Major Conley. I cannot think how be fitting today to talk to you about sexual assault. I want to share a story with you, and I think this will kind of relate to sexual assault. In August of 2006, my daughter was called by the pastor of the church to come to a youth meeting. When she got there, it wasn't a youth meeting. The pastor of the church, ladies and gentlemen, raped my daughter. This was a church that had 2,000 members. This, church, this uh, town I'm from is called Chatham, Virginia. It has approximately 1,500 members of civilians there. My daughter was told by the pastor, do not tell this. Because if you do, you're going to get in trouble, and they, you'll be scrutinized. And I'm the pastor of the church, and it will be bad for me and you. Well, you know how fathers are. You pick up something that ain't right about your daughter. And I started questioning her one day. I said, something's not right. What's going on? I can't tell you. My wife looked at me and said, when she's ready to tell you, she will. This is a great church, great people. Three days, three days before Christmas, I get a phone call. It was my daughter's boyfriend's father. He was a pastor of a church. And I could tell by the statement or the tone of his voice, something was wrong. He said, I need to talk to you, come and see me. So I drove to his house and I got there my daughter was sitting there, her boyfriend was there, and her father. I thought maybe they had a big disagreement, or maybe was, he, he wanted us to come along and try to um, minimize the, the argument. Well, when I sat down, the father commenced to telling me what had happened. My life turned upside down when I sat down. You met, a few years ago, there was a slogan, sexual assault it, uh, hurts one, but it affects all. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, it was a community that was in turmoil. Because what, the next day I had to go to the church, chairman of the digging board, and tell him about what had happened. This is Christmas time. People are rejoicing for Christmas. You can really give gifts. Well, that church went into turmoil because this pastor was well known in that community. What I didn't tell a lot of people about, not only did the pastor uh, have sex with my daughter, rape my daughter, he had unprotected sex. My daughter was pregnant by him. But when my daughter went and told him about it, he said, we can't, you cannot have this baby. You will be in trouble and I will be in trouble. He took her to Roanoke, Virginia to abort the child, and he left her. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. I personally had a family member who was in turmoil. I personally had a wife who fainted when she was told about it. I personally lost a grandchild because of sexual assault or rape. I've been doing this job since 2008. I was very upset with my daughter because she wouldn't let me pursue it. And I asked her, why would you not let me pursue this? She said, I can't go through it. Because when I, when I made a statement, is anyone ever do anything to my children? I apologize what I'm going to say. I was going to kill them. Which, what she told me, that's one of the reasons I wouldn't tell you because i would already gone through the turmoil of this. But losing my father beside this would be even more terrible. My daughter was called and threatened on her job. My daughter had to actually eventually leave the church she was belonged to. Fortunately, she married the young man, and to, in August, she's going to have a bouncing baby boy. Thank you. 
But what I want to tell you is I've had a number of sexual assault cases. I've been doing sexual, uh, sexual assault prevention training uh, for Virginia since 2008. I think altogether, civilian and uh, soldiers, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 victims. And you know, it took me until talking to a young lady one day and she was telling me, I cannot discuss this. I don't want to talk to anybody about it for me to understand what happened to my daughter. You know, people go, when they hear about someone being raped, sexual assault, the first thing they do is they put that person on trial. Not the perpetrator, but they put the victim on trial. Why was they there? Why was they drinking? What clothes were they wearing? They shouldn't have been there. It's their fault. And when I do a lot of training, I get, I laugh when I see male uh, infantry men there saying, I don't need to be here. Men can't be raped. Well, let me tell you something. In the last four months, we've had three or four cases of same sex sexual assault in the state of Virginia. Let me tell you, it's not an individual that I have not seen or touched, small children to adults. Sexual assault isn't about sex, ladies and gentlemen. It's about power. It's about people trying to take advantage of someone weak. It's a crime, and it hurts a lot of people. The Army's new term, uh, term this year is speak up. An unheard voice is a defeated army. But let me tell you, it's true. Because if we don't, each one of us do not take it to heart that it's wrong when you see young soldiers out there joking about someone else's private parts. If we don't speak up and say it's not dignity and respect when we are belittling somebody and calling them names of, out of their name and referring it to someone like a dog, then we need to understand we're defeating our army. This army was founded on the foundation of respect, dignity, and honor, and defending people who have been weak and abused. Many soldiers have died in Afghanistan, Iraq, for freedom, give people the right to liberty and respect. And yet, we as a military, we as civilians, will go out there and do the same thing to our brethren and take that liberty and right away. This is from my heart. I'm not a great speaker, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you what I know and what I've dealt with. I do sexual assault not for the money. It's not. I do sexual assault prevention because I want to make sure no one in the Virginia National Guard or I have to deal with have to ever live through the turmoil and hell that we lived it with. But when your family members, and I can tell you, I've heard people say, if you think storm won't come on your door, live a while. You do not need that storm. It's not about wording, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about being a few slogans. It's about each and every one of us living like brothers and sisters and wear the uniform proudly as we do. Because when we fight and die and we see Medal of Honor winners who give their life up to defend someone, we need to do the same thing when we see these people out there doing the wrong thing to each other. I tell soldiers today, remember when you was on the range and someone had a weapon and they pointed down range. You check fire that, that range, you stop and you correct that, that uh, incident. You make sure you fix it and you go back to the mission. When you see those soldiers out there making innuendos, sending pictures and talking about someone wrongly, you check fire them. You correct that, you fix it, and you make sure they go on with the mission. Let me let you also understand, perpetrators now don't get away with it, and it can harm them too, because it harms their family. That preacher lost his job. That preacher made somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 a year, when you count benefits. He had two children and a wife. They lost everything. So not only was my daughter and family was affected, but his family was affected. That community was affected. And most of all, my child was affected. Thank you for your time.